Good evening, everyone. We want you to feel welcome as we join together uh, over the internet and through YouTube uh, to study uh, God's Word. Uh, as we uh, say hello to you and welcome you along this evening, just to make you aware that we are beginning uh, a new series in the study of the Lord's Prayer. Having just finished off our series in the Ten Commandments, uh, we're going to spend some weeks now uh, looking at uh, the Lord's Prayer and we trust that you'll be blessed uh, through that. Now just by way of announcement relating back uh, to the Ten Commandments we're launching a, a vodcast now that may be something uh, unknown or alien to you but a, a vodcast uh, is a, a video uh, and it's a video discussion and we're going to call it AB plus uh, A is for Annette because Mark Annett is leading that and heading that up. Uh, B is Boyd for myself, and the plus uh, is for guests who will be invited uh, in each week to help us answer questions. And the plus is also uh, relevant to you because we need you uh, to uh, bring us your questions. We need you to listen in. We need you to be involved. So A, B plus, uh, and that will go out uh, on a Thursday evening at 8pm. So our first broadcast is going to be uh, Thursday evening the 26th of November uh, and that's available from 8pm. You can pick that up on Facebook and you can pick it up on YouTube uh, and it'll be a recording uh, so you'll be able to go back to that or pick it up at a time convenient to yourself. So we trust you'll be able to, to drop in uh, and experience that and uh, use that also as an opportunity to further our learning in the Ten Commandments. So back to this evening, to set the scene, we're going to turn to the Gospel of Matthew and we're going to read from chapter uh, 6. Uh, and as we come to read from verse 5, the heading in this portion is uh, the model prayer. Matthew uh, chapter 6 from verse 5. And when you pray... You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we'll end there at verse 13 and trust for Almighty God to add his blessing to that reading of Scripture. Let's now come uh, to our God in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we come aside this evening uh, to study your word and to, to join together with one another, Lord, uh, through this uh, Bible study. Lord God, as we bow before you, we confess that our prayer life could be better. We confess that there are many things that get in our way which give us the excuse to say that we didn't have enough time to pray. And so, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for our lack of prayer. We pray, Lord, like the disciples, that you would teach us to pray. And Lord, that you would help us 
by the strength and the power of your Holy Spirit to be people of prayer, both in the secret place on our own and also, Lord, meeting with our brothers and sisters in Christ where the opportunities are available to us. So, Father, as we come to study the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, we pray that your Holy Spirit may guide us and may teach us. And Lord, as we take on board this teaching, we pray most of all, Lord, that you would help us to be greater people of prayer. Lord, that you would help us to grasp the significance of prayer. You'd help us, Lord, to understand the power of prayer. And Lord, you would help us to see the need for prayer. And so, Lord God, we lay ourselves before you this evening, trusting that your Holy Spirit would come and move amongst us. Lord God, that we would be stirred in our hearts and that we would be raised up and that we would be known to be a people of prayer. As we come in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord's Prayer is given by Matthew as a section uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. We have the Lord's Prayer, or some would go as far as to say the disciples' prayer, because the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And that is something that we need. That is something we need to hear more about. That is something we need to do more about. It is a desire in our church that we want to see the followers of Jesus Christ say, Lord, teach me. Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is important. Prayer is vital. Prayer is oxygen to the believer and to the work of Jesus Christ. And prayer, sadly, is something that we as a congregation currently were lacking in. And so it is good for us tonight to come and like the disciples to say, Lord, teach us to pray. The prayer uh, that Jesus then gives to his disciples. It could be described as being uh, quite brief uh, and yet it is to be taken as being more like headings or prayer points. In the Bible, God is personable. God speaks. God relates to people. And therefore, we can say that uh, God is not an object. God is a person. Thomas Watson, uh, the Puritan, once said that the Ten Commandments are the rule of our life. And those are the commandments that we've been studying in recent weeks. But then he uh, then went on to say that the creed that is the Apostles' Creed is the sum of our faith. And the Lord's Prayer that we're starting to study tonight, the Lord's Prayer is the pattern of our prayer. The Lord's Prayer, if we stop and analyse it, we could say that it can be broken down into three components. It can be broken down into a preface, it can be broken down into petitions, and it can be broken down into the conclusion. Three separate elements of the prayer. The prayer reads, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you ponder the words of the Lord's Prayer, you'll be able to see that there are also six steps of prayer that can be taught from the Lord's Prayer. Firstly, address God in the rightful manner as our Father. Worship and praise God 
for who he is and for all that he has done for us. Acknowledge that it is God's will and plan and that he is in control. It's not our plan, it's not our will and therefore we are invited to come to God to seek his will and to know his guidance. Ask God for things that we need. Fifthly, confess our sins and repent. And then number six, request protection and help in overcoming sin and the attacks of Satan. I don't know if you have thought much uh, or studied or ever wondered about when and where the Lord's Prayer came into being. Well, we have said here that Matthew records it uh, as being part of uh, the section on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we have uh, acknowledged that the disciples said, Lord, teach us uh, to pray. When, when on earth Jesus prayed, and we know that Jesus was a man of prayer, it was a regular pattern for him to go off into some quiet place, whether that be low down or high up in the mountain, uh, to spend time with his heavenly father in prayer. He went away from the noise. He went away from the hustle and the bustle of the town, whether it be early in the morning or late at night. But it became apparent to the disciples that when Jesus would come back from the place of prayer, when Jesus would come down from the mountain after spending time in prayer, he always had an appearance, an appearance that was peaceful, calm and strong. It, it may have been uh, his appearance after a time of prayer that actually moved the disciples to say, Lord, teach us to pray. They, they wanted to know, they wanted to have the blessing of this inner peace and contentment and strength that Jesus had. The words teach us to pray, well, they could be viewed as a confession by the disciples that they had a need. Something was lacking in their lives. Sadly, today, so often we don't see prayer as a need. We, we see prayer as something that we can pick and choose, prayer that we can use whenever we're in a crisis. But apart from that, it's too much hassle. Um, we don't have time. And yet, as the Lord's people, we should be spending more time in the place of prayer. It is important and it's vital. Uh, and by the disciples saying teach us to pray it was also a confession of ignorance in that the disciples were acknowledging that they didn't actually know how to pray and they didn't know what to pray for jesus he explained to the disciples that they could pray themselves they didn't need an intermediary to pray for them they could go to god themselves did they need to be introduced? No, because God already knew who they were. And when they thought about going to prayer, then the disciples, in a sense, they became nervous about, well, if we go to pray to God, what do we call God? How do we approach him? And Jesus says, call him Father. Not only were the disciples unsure uh, about what name to use but they were also unsure about what to pray for and so Jesus taught the disciples to pray using the model prayer using the Lord's prayer using the disciples prayer which was an original prayer it was an original prayer beginning with father a new name for God if you think across Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament, you, you will not come across a single instance of someone speaking of God as their father. And so it was left to Jesus to tell us, to tell the disciples that when we pray, we can say our father. We could never know 
God the Father, except through the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, and his life and work and ministry, his death and resurrection in this world. Some people question why we call God Father in the light of shorter catechism question four the fourth question of the catechism says what is God and the answer comes God is a spirit infinite eternal and unchangeable and his being wisdom power holiness justice goodness and truth in the bible God chooses to make himself known in male terms hence the title our father is given by Jesus as opposed to our mother we could say that a god is the best father in respect of wisdom love riches the ability to remake us as humans into something new we could say that god is the best and perfect father because he never dies he is eternal the word father is here to teach us word father teaches us confidence trust faith holiness and boldness and so when we pray our father we acknowledge that we have links we have family links we acknowledge that god is our father and that we have links with each one who prays to him in that way we acknowledge that we have brothers and sisters in the family of god God who is our Father. Our Father is high. Our Father is lifted up because he is in heaven. And heaven is more than God's email address. Heaven is the place where everything is perfect. And we know that God is perfect. And we have the opportunity and the invitation to pray to the perfect God our Father which art in heaven reflects that God is in the place of supreme dominion ruling over the whole universe our Father which art in heaven the prayer begins with our Father because we're all children of God we've been created by him we're made in his image So in that sense, he is the father of us all and we pray for his mercy and we pray for his forgiveness on all of us, not just for ourselves. The, the prayer continues with which art in heaven uh, uh, and in the old English art, it means to be or to exist. Uh, and that's a reminder that we pray to God that lives in heaven. And that we do not pray to objects uh, on earth. And if we step back then and look at the prayer, it's in a twofold form. Firstly, it's in twofold because this prayer is given by the gospel writers in two different forms and entire, two entirely different connections. In Matthew's account, which we read tonight, the prayer is given, as we've said, as part of the Sermon on the Mount. And in the context and alongside um, the criticism of the prayers of the hypocrites and the heathen, Luke introduces the prayer after the Galilean ministry. And he represents it as being given in response to a request from one of the disciples. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples it gives us in Luke however no note of time or place and it's quite possible that the incident which it records took place much earlier the latter form is much shorter than that of the one given by Matthew uh, as part of the Sermon on the Mount and the common parts differ materially in language so it's given, the Lord's Prayer is given by two writers, um, Matthew and Luke, uh, and it's given in two 
uh, different forms. Uh, then there is the arrangement in addition in addition uh, to the opening salutation, Our Father who art in heaven, the Lord's Prayer consists then of six petitions. These are arranged into three equal parts. Uh, the first part, the thought is directed uh, toward God and his great purposes. In the second part, the attention is directed to our condition uh, and our wants. And the two sets of petitions are closely related, therefore creating a line of progress that runs through the whole prayer. The petitions of the first part are inseparable as each includes the one which follows. As the hallowing of God's name requires the coming of his kingdom, so the kingdom comes through doing his will. Again, the first part calls for the second. For if his will is to be done by us, we must have sustenance, forgiveness and deliverance from evil. If we seek first the glory of God, the end requires our good. While we hallow his name, we are sanctified in him. Uh, and as we looked at the Ten Commandments, we could see how they interlinked uh, uh, and were connected to each other. And likewise, when we look at the Lord's Prayer, we see it is one unit, one block with all these different aspects which are interconnected in it. And so as we go back to, to the Catechism again, where we go to question 99, what rule hath God given for our direction in prayer? The answer, the whole word of God is of use to direct us in prayer, but the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught his disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And then moving on to the next catechism, what doth the preface of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The preface of the Lord's Prayer, that's the piece we're looking at tonight, which is our Father, which art in heaven, teacheth us to draw near to God with all holy reverence and confidence as children to a Father, able and ready to help us and that we should pray with and for others. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, for tonight, question 101. What do we pray for in the first petition? In the first petition, which is, hallowed be thy name, we pray that God would enable us and others to glorify him in all that whereby he maketh himself known, and that he would dispose all things to his own glory. There is no such thing in the Lord's Prayer as O Mary or O Saints or O Angels. It is our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven and then goes on, hallowed be thy name, etc. The prayer invites us to come and talk to our Father in prayer. It acknowledges that our Father is in heaven. It acknowledges us, it acknowledges to us that we must enter his gates, as the psalmist says, with thanksgiving and praise. And so every prayer that we bring to our Father who art in heaven should start with thanksgiving, should start with praise. Jesus demonstrated that while he was on earth. And so it is good for us to come and to praise God and to thank God as we enter in uh, to the place of prayer, to appreciate what God is doing for us and God is doing in our lives. And yet, as we come to pray, we must understand that there is not a particular formula that gets us to the heart of God. It is our relationship and our attitude to God, not the formula of words. And we must know that when we come to God in prayer, we cannot deceive God as to who we are or what we are. Uh, we must acknowledge him as the all-seeing God to whom we can turn to prayer and call our Father. The second part of the preface is which art in heaven? Heaven 
is out of sight. Uh, and therefore our conversation with God in prayer must be spiritual. It, it is on high. It is above everything else. When we come to prayer, it is God's desire for us. And it should be our desire that our prayer would raise our thoughts or lift our minds and our gaze uh, above the things of earth, the things that press us down and trouble us, the temptations and the trials, the challenges, the stresses and the strains, and our gaze should be fixed heavenward to Almighty God in prayer. And there, when we are lifting up our gaze to God in prayer, we're lifting up our hearts from earth to heaven. Heaven is a place of perfect purity. Heaven is the place where God resides. and He is the perfect holy God. We come to him with all of our burdens and all of our desires. And as we've said, we firstly come with our praise and our thanksgiving. He is not only as a father able to help us, he is also able to do great things for us. He is able to do more than we can ask or more than we can think. And he has the wherewithal to supply all our needs, to give us a great blessing. He is a father and therefore we come to know him with boldness. But we're mindful that he is a father in heaven and therefore we come to him in reverence. Mindful that we are sinners, that we are not perfect, that we are not holy. But by his grace we're able to approach his throne. By prayer we can come to God in heaven. We, we send out the signal that it is there that we profess to be going after this life is ended. And so our relationship, our prayer life, our communication between ourselves and God, between earth and heaven, we will send out a signal to those around us that we are in communication with God, we are in love with God, and it is to whom, it is him to whom we are going after this life is over. The, the story is told, uh, and we will just come with this really uh, in closing tonight. Uh, the story is told of a young man, and the story could be true of many families and many sons, whether it be a family in a, man in a mansion or in a modest home. The young man sank deep into sin and shame and brought disgrace uh, to all those with whom he was connected. Eventually, things got so bad that one by one, uh, the young man's friends turned their backs and left the young man. They'd had enough. They could take it no longer. There was only one person who clung on, and that was the young man's poor old father. He was the one who had suffered most. He'd suffered most at his young son's hand. The shame and the disgrace and the pain. And yet the old father was the one who still stuck by him. One of the neighbours dropped in with the old father one day and said, Why don't you turf him out? The reply from the poor old man was, I can't. I'm his father. God is the father of humanity. And even though we sin, God still loves us as a father loves their wayward son. That should bring us great encouragement and great hope that we as sinners are welcomed by God. And that those who are outside of the kingdom of God are invited into a relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. Who can keep 
the Heavenly Father and us as human sons and daughters apart. Sin keeps us apart, but faith in Jesus Christ brings us together. Galatians 3 and 26 says, Ye are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. It is faith that makes us the children of God. And it's not until we have saving faith in Jesus Christ that we are able to call God our Father. God is the perfect Father. And yet too often by our actions we are his imperfect children. But praise God that we are made perfect and acceptable by faith in Jesus Christ. I trust tonight that you are one of his family. That you are trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Saviour. And if not, tonight is your opportunity to turn to him and ask him to forgive your sins and accept him as Lord and Saviour. And for those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour, remember how he taught the disciples to pray. Remember how Jesus prayed. And so as followers of Jesus and part of his family here on earth, we are called to the place of prayer, both private and public. And so let us tonight recommit ourselves to the place of prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the example of your son, Jesus Christ, when he was in this earth, how he prayed to you. Lord, we know that you have made us for prayer. We know that you invite us to pray. And so, Lord, we pray again that you would give us the strength to overcome the challenges that lie before us in the place of prayer. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us in the spiritual battle relating to prayer. Father, we pray that you would humble us as your children to be united in the place of prayer, to seek your face. And Lord, then knowing that as we seek your face, you will pour out your blessing upon the work of the people of this congregation. And Lord, that your name would be lifted high and magnified. And Lord, as we close tonight, we use the words of that prayer that you give to your disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Folks, we bid you a good night and trust that you may know God's blessing in the week that lies ahead. Take care.